Welcome to Military Spouse World One to One, a weekday podcast featuring a military family shaker and mover, helping you navigate this amazing chapter in life. Here's your host, Dave Etter. On today's episode of Spouse World One to One, we catch up with Susan Reynolds, also known as the Bad Mother Advocate and the host of the podcast Spouse Spouts. Hello, Susan. How are you? Hey, Dave. How are you doing? Outstanding. I'm having a blast. It sounds like you're in there cooking. I had to reheat some coffee. Sorry about that. Hey, no, that works for me. Matter of fact, that's a good idea. Where is my coffee cup? Oh, well, I'll get some later. Um, Thank you for being with us on Spouse World One to One. I am very excited to be here in cyberland with you dave ha ha you like that (laughs) it's true it is true (laughs) it is it's true technology is awesome i'm loving that we can do this and you're in germany i'm loving the fact that people are listening to us right now in their newly enabled cars that have the ability to run podcasts um that just blows my mind not gonna lie that blows my mind yep you Yes. are a shaker and a mover in the spouse world. You are married and your husband is in the Air Force and your kids growing up as an Air Force brat. Yep. And you have decided you're helping out with military spouses. You, you call yourself what? The bad mother advocate. Tell me I'm about that. I'm a bad mother advocate. Okay. So first of all, I swore I would never marry anyone in the military. And then I met my husband, Jeremy. I just, I remember on our third date, I, just, I wanted to marry him and have his children. That was it. I was like, this is it. This is the one. This man really likes me. And he thinks, even though I'm completely crazy, he seems to enjoy that about me. This is great. I think he still likes you. He still does. It's amazing. (laughs) And I was working for the Department of the Air Force. I was doing catering and marketing out at the Sembot Club. And I liked it. I really did. I loved it. I loved event planning. I loved the marketing of it. And I loved that side of it. But there was definitely something that was missing. I had always been drawn to advocacy. I had advocated for myself when I was in college, stepped into my first disability services office on my own. I advocated for myself all throughout college. I had taught other people how to advocate, not even knowing that's what I was doing. I wanted to, at one point, become a special education teacher, so I minored in it with a major in psychology, but I didn't like how special education was actually being taught. Uh, The special educator, the teacher, him or herself, constant meetings, not that one-on-one with the kids that I was longing for. I was desperate for it. I wanted to be in the thick of it with the kids. Right. Because I I just I identified with them. These were my people. These were the members of my tribe, so to speak. This is my village, right? And of course I identify with them. I am an adult, but I was a child, you know, at one point. I am an adult with a yes, with a learning disability. Some people are very childish still. So I am, I know I am. But I have a learning disability. I have an auditory processing disorder. Right. I'm ADHD and I have have mild anxiety. So I have four lovely disorders slash labels, however you want to call them. And it's all wrapped up with a big, pretty bow and sometimes purple hair, Susan Reynolds. And I felt this kinship because of course, why wouldn't I? This is my family. This is my disability family. Right. But I, I really lost my way. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie about that. I really lost my way. I thought I wanted to do all sorts of other things. And so I did, which is why I did do a job in catering and event planning. And I did do a job working at a university doing admissions. And I did do a job doing all sorts of other things, but I was never happy with it. When we were stationed in Nebraska at Offutt Air Force Base, I had been working in this job as an admissions counselor for a, a local university and I was miserable. It was a toxic working environment. It was toxic. Mm-hmm. And I felt like everything I was doing was was a scam as well. Because these are people who absolutely knew when there were changes made to the GI Bill in order to get spouses to do their online university. And I just didn't like that. I felt like it was really taking advantage of the military. So I quit. I came home and I told my husband, I said, I can't do this anymore. I have to get the heck out of there. And he agreed. He goes, you belong to teach. Why don't you go back to school and get your teaching certification? Okay. And so I did. Well, you know, be a teacher, they say. It's going to be the greatest ever, right? It's wonderful. Will, yeah. Your license will transfer anywhere, little military spouse. You need to believe that. No, not true. Not true at all. 
Maybe it did back in the, when George Washington was around. Exactly. Um, but it didn't when we moved here. And that was ridiculous. And so North Carolina was really just being ridiculous. The, the whole system was just ridiculous broken. is the best word. It was very broken because they had at that point, now this is 2010, they had reciprocity with 32 states, but none of them Midwestern states. And oh, wait, I just came from a Midwestern state. So thanks. And they were going to make me go back to school so I could get certified again. And that meant I basically I was going to end up getting a third undergraduate degree. And mm. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. And I'm not paying for that. That's ridiculous. Where did the term bad mother advocate come from? Well, I could see actually, mad. Yeah. I yeah. see mad mother. So it was a series of really like Lemony Snicket in, his un- in the unfortunate events. <laughs> That's what, you know, I went through the same thing, except it was really awful. Wow. Um, So about six months after we had gotten here, we lost our rental home to a tornado. And Jeremy had been given short order, a short notice deployment. Our house was lost on a Saturday. He was supposed to be deploying on Monday. We couldn't actually get into our neighborhood until the next day after the tornadoes Mm. on that Sunday. And I'm not kidding, Dave. We're standing there in front of our busted up house. Ian is seven months old on my hip. And we've got a cat that's trapped in the house somewhere that we need to find. I looked at him and I said, I, I don't know how you're going to deploy tomorrow. Your family just became homeless. And he said, yeah, I'm going to need to call the commander. You think? <laughs> and so they gave him an extension. Ian and I, we all moved into a hotel. Finally, then we were eventually able to move in with my mother. But it took a while because, of course, she wasn't prepared for us to move in with her. No, uh-uh. Retired from teaching in Sembach and moved back to the United States. So they were very, they were really unprepared for us to, for my, for Ian and myself to move in. We weren't supposed to lose our house to a tornado, right? Right. And then I started fighting TRICARE because Ian needed a cranial reshaping helmet. And between everything that we had going on, I am, I am shocked to this day that I did not break. And I, I think, I think most people would have, I think a lot of people I think a lot of people look at me as, oh, you're the, you're so strong. No, I just had to keep on moving. So I started fighting TRICARE. I started getting us a house. I started doing everything because if I didn't do it, Jeremy was in Afghanistan. He wasn't there to take, pick up my slack. He wasn't around. He was deployed. He needed me to get these things done. Not only yeah. did you get the things done for your yeah. son, but you also got things done for others as well along the way. And so I, I discovered in that process that the little reshaping helmet that Ian needed was not covered by TRICARE despite their policy stating that they cover all FDA approved devices. Well, that's not true. That is a bold faced lie. And I really wish they would just put this statement is a lie. It's only here to make you feel good, you know, <laughs> but it is a lie. I, I actually, I just wish they would remove the policy because it's not true. Kind of like the commissaries save you 30 <laughs> percent. Yes. I wish that that marketing slogan needs to go away, too. That's <laughs> Jeremy comes home from Afghanistan. We have moved into a house. We started a support group for families going through the same thing that we were with trying to find helmets and funding. At that moment, that was when I made the decision. I am going to fight this policy if it's the last thing that I do. The thing that I didn't know about myself, Dave, was I had for so long thought I never wanted to have kids. And then, of course, I met Jeremy and and that changed. But the moment Ian was put into my arms that August 2012, when he was born, the moment he was put into my arms, all of a sudden, the the restlessness in me, the the yearning, the seeking, the I have no idea what I'm going to do with myself that just stopped. It stopped 100%. Like becoming his mother, it really centered me. It's a shift. And it was a complete paradigm shift and it was a complete mentality shift. Mm-hmm. And I remember looking down at him and I said, I will always be here to protect you. I will die protecting you because that is what I do. I am your mother. Mm-hmm. I am your mommy. And that's exactly what I have done all these years. Where the name Bad Mother Advocate actually comes from was after Military Spouse of the Year in 2013, I was talking to Alicia Hines Ward, and she is the one that said, no, honey, you're a bad mother advocate like Shaft. She's like, shut your mouth. And that was <laughs> it. That is actually from a conversation with one of my closest friends, because she knew I had this desire to 
just get out there and advocate for people. And at that point, TRICARE for Kids, the legislation I worked on, had passed. I was working on another piece of legislation with my congresswoman, Renee Elmers. She's no longer in office, but uh, when she was in office, and that was called the TIME Act, it's where TRICARE is supposed to, and same with Express Scripts, give you 90 days notice on any policy and prescription changes. Hmm. The downfall is, is that TRICARE is still not following that policy. And now I'm working on another piece of legislation that actually infor- makes TRICARE follow through on their FDA-approved devices policy. So to me, I look at that as another piece of ridiculousness that we actually have to pass a policy to tell TRICARE to enforce their own policies. So let's jump ahead now to you were awarded the Joan Orr Air Force Spouse of the Year. What year was that? 2014. I won all the way up to Big Air Force. Wow. Yeah. Just by getting really cool. out there and saying, I am not going to put up with this. This is an injustice. You're going to fix it. Yes. <laughs> so when the so our previous squadron commander and the first sergeant and the chief sent this email asking for suggestions for this award. Jeremy was deployed again. And I said, well, what do you think? And he goes, I think you should see if they would be willing to put you in for it. Because I I think that's what they're asking from the email, but they're kind of doing it in a roundabout way. Mm. Oh, okay. We send it, you know, I sent, you know, I forward the email and everything. I was like, yeah, I... I, would you guys be willing to put me in for this? And the commander responds back, I think you would be an excellent candidate. And I thought, okay, cool, <laughs> sir. Thank you. This is excellent. He gave me so excited. He was so funny. And um, I won, obviously, at the squadron level. Since I was the only nominee for both our squadron and then the next level up, the group, I won at that level. And then I went on to compete at the wing. And I won at the wing level. And then I went on to compete at the numbered Air Force. I went at the numbered Air Force level. Then I went on to compete at the MAGCOM level. And our MAGCOM is ACC, Air Combat Command. And I won at that level. And then I went, and then it was all the big match come. And then it comes down to there's only 12 of us or 13 of us. Wouldn't you know, I was actually competing against Chris Pape that year. Wow. He was over on the education side. So he was Air Education Training Command, MAGCOM winner. And I was the ACC MAGCOM winner. And then I won the overall. And I asked the commander, I said, well, what if I, I said, what happens? I said, are you guys going to be okay if I, if I don't win? He and uh, the chief and the first sergeant were standing there and, and looking at me and they just started to laugh. And they said, oh, Susan, honey, no, you don't understand. We wrote this for you to win the Air Force. You're going to. And I said, oh, okay, you guys, you seem a little confident here. Confident? Yeah. You seem almost beyond confident. I don't know what you are right now, but okay, <laughs> they're crazy. Like, I walked away going, those guys are nuts. Yeah. Whatever. And I, so we found out that I won at the MAGCOM level. Two days later, Jeremy comes home from Afghanistan. Everyone is there, and they're all excited. And they're like, hey, you know, you know the news about Susan. He goes, yes. He goes, it's, it's cool to be home, but it's cool to come home to hear this. And he goes, I don't think I've ever been more proud of her. I, I, he goes, and, and I get more and more proud of her every day. But I, And I didn't realize it was possible to be more more proud of her. And I thought, oh my goodness, you are so wonderful. I love you. And then of of course, well, thank you. And then of course I won at the, at the overall Air Force level and all these letters start flowing in and I get a letter from General Welsh. She was our then chief of staff. And the thing that made me happiest with that letter is that he didn't say that I was at Pope Army Airfield, even though that's where Jeremy's squadron is at. But Jeremy's orders actually state Fort Bragg. He wrote in the letter, Susan Reynolds, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And that really meant something to me because I'm not on an Air Force base. I'm on an Army post. To do what I've done where I had to work with two branches of service to get them to communicate, to support families, to provide services for our families, because our, per, our the people in our squadron, Dave, they also deploy only with the Army. We had a discrepancy in family support because it wasn't being filtered down to us on the Air Force side. And as soon as I brought that to the attention of the people who in the know on Fort Bragg, and I did it with such politeness and an, like almost in an earnest manner, immediately change was made. You're right. We need to be supported. You guys are deploying with us. Why aren't we providing this family support for you? We're so sorry. And as I remember saying to one of the, com- I remember saying to the garrison commander, well, sir, you only know what you know. If you haven't been told that this, in- this information and these resources aren't flowing to the right people, how can you fix something that you don't know is an issue? He looked at me stunned. He goes, oh, okay, thank you. I, uh, that's very compassionate. No, it just makes sense, sir. I think you're putting too much pressure on yourself. You need to... 
It's, you need to slow down before you give yourself a panic attack or a heart attack. Okay, let's shift gears yet one more time. Yes. You are now involved in podcasting. I am, and I have a really great partner and co-host. His name is Dave <laughs> Ebber. <laughs> yes, that's true. We we do run a very popular, and uh, we've been going on now for, yikes. Gosh, almost, almost a year. Yeah, almost a year. Yeah. Spouse, spouse. Yeah. But I you have it. a history of, of, of wanting and a desire of getting into podcasting. Tell me about that. Well, I love writing and I had this wonderful military spouse column for the longest time. And I, and I had it for almost three years. It was brilliant and it was so much fun. It was my baby and I loved it. I have dyslexia, Dave. <laughs> and because of that, all dyslexia. I have to. Anybody with dyslexia, let's untie together. Wait, no, that's yes. unite. <laughs> yes. And I have to be very mindful of working within my strength. I started to get very frustrated with the writing process because I wouldn't say cumbersome, but at times it was cumbersome. And I always wanted to do podcasting. So when I was living in Germany and working as a civilian, I used to be on AFN. I was a volunteer afternoon DJ with uh, first my friend Leah, and then she got out of the Air Force, and then my friend Ryan, and he also ended up getting out of the Air Force. You know, they did their time, and that was it. I I remember when we referred to Ramstein as Ramstahl one time and the Yusefi commander, I'll never forget it, Yusefi commander was on the phone with us within five minutes. Susan, it is detrimental to the morale of Ramstein and the surrounding KMC communities. Please refer to us as Ramstein. Yes, sir. It's still Ramstahl. Okay. I know. For those of you who do not know, Stahl in German means... Traffic jam. Traffic jam. Oh, the yeah. Germans have one word for it. It's called Stahl. Stahl. Yeah, it was awesome, right? And he did not like that. I was like, okay, sorry, sir. But I always liked it. I always liked I liked the broadcast side. I thought it was fun. What I wanted to do with Bad Mother Advocate was not a blog. I wanted to do a podcast. But I, I didn't want to do it on my own. I, I like having a co-host with me, and I couldn't find anyone who could really commit. It just sat by the wayside. I, right, I mean, I still have the, yeah, I guess it's a domain, registered with Blog Talk Radio under Bad Mother Advocate, right? I mean, I still do. It's crazy. And uh, thank goodness I'm not paying for it. It's just free. But at the same point, I still have it just in case. I mean, I even saved one with Podbean. How long am I supposed to do this for? Is it a 15 minute show or is it an hour long show? What do I do here? You know, I don't know. I didn't know what to do. And so then you actually were named the Army Spouse of the Year. Last and I year. remember seeing last year, I remember seeing something in your profile that I identified with. And so I messaged you and then we started talking podcasting and we became very good friends from there. And then I think I posted something on Facebook one day going, I really want a radio show because I just called into your show, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, male yeah. military spouse show. And we had so much fun together. You, Jay, and myself, the three of us had a blast. What keeps Spouse Spouts listeners engaged is that we are live. We're not pre-recorded. No, we are this live. Is, now, some this interviews... This is pre-recorded. This is pre-recorded. Yes. It's, it's heavily edited yes. because I have yes. a heavy breath, <gasps> which you hear all the time. I take those out. And so that's, you know, I love Spouse Spouts, actually. And I'm glad. Thank you for pushing me into doing it. Uh, now I'm going to start pushing myself into taking Spouse Spouts to the next level. I, I know we're ready for that. I know we're ready to become... Can, do, podcasting consulting. We have, Dave, something between the two of us and as a team, we offer services and advice and knowledge and humor, everything. We offer a lot of talent and a lot of knowledge. I know that people want to come to us asking us things and asking and wanting to have questions with us. And they have, I mean, they have questions for us and things of that nature. Why not offer that up? Why not see if we can start doing, you know, live shows on the road when you're eventually back from, from Germany, when you guys are back in the United mm -hmm. States? Or we can go to speaking engagements at podcaster forums and things of that nature or blogging forums and things because I see now in the blogging community that they're adding in podcasting as well because mm -hmm. it is really starting to become the way. I mean, people are really looking at podcasting as what they really want to do. It's, it's, and it's, it's fun, an amazing and I phenomenon. Love it. It's an amazing yeah. phenomenon and, and I'm just... <laughs> well, a funny story. I want to tell you a funny story, but as I was being presented the Joan Orr Award, in, it was September 2014 
2018, it was at the Air Force Association's Air and Space Conference. They do this massive award ceremony. All the airmen of the year are there from every MAGCOM. It's really cool. And then they do civilian awards. Think, you know, a big, huge squadron awards. It's really a very cool, uh, that opening ceremony. So I'm, I'm called up and I had not changed my shoes yet. This was really by mistake. And, and it just stuck from that point on. And I was wearing my Wonder Woman chucks, right? <laughs> and I was not expecting to be called so soon. So I hadn't had the chance to change into a, a nicer pair of, of dress shoes. And so I'm in my Wonder Woman chucks because I'm walking around and my feet are hurt. I didn't want my feet to hurt right away at 930 in the morning, right? So I'm called and I've got to go up on stage and General Welsh puts his hand out to shake my hand. And I look at him and I said, I think this is going to be the only time we get to meet. Can I have a hug? He had this massive grin from ear to ear, and he was like, yes, you can. He was like, awesome. I was like, thank you, sir. Secretary James is standing there. She goes, I hope I get one of those, too. She was like, I never get hugs. <laughs> She's like, this is so much fun. And I was like, awesome. I'm having the best time. And she looks down at my feet, and she has this huge grin, and she goes, great shoes, by the way. I said, I forgot to change them. She goes, oh, no, it suits your personality perfectly. She's like, never take those off. This is you. I was like, yes, ma'am. So they're starting to read out some of the things that I've done in order to earn the award, right? And I'm in, I'm having such an out of body experience. And I mean, I was really, I was actually lightheaded. I was, I'm actually holding on to Secretary James with all of my, like all of my might. Like I'm not kidding. Cause I really thought my knees were going to buckle and I was going to pass out on her because I was that nervous. And I, and we're smiling and I'm trying not to cry. And she's given, I mean, she's nonstop hugging me or putting her arm around my shoulder just to really just, she's like, you're great. You're doing great, honey. You're doing great. I was like, please don't let me pass out. Please don't let me pass out. She's like, I'm not going to let you pass out. I was like, I have no idea what's going on. She goes, I'll tell you when to turn and smile for the camera. I was like, thank you. And she said, you're so silly. I was like, I don't mean to be. She goes, it's okay. Again, she goes, it's so your personality. I was like, thanks. Okay. And uh, so that, you know, and then I was, as I was talking to General Welsh, he was talking to me before he wouldn't let me leave the stage right away. He was talking to me and I looked at him and I said, Hey, can I ask you for a huge favor? And he goes, what's that? I said, see that really good looking tech sergeant over there. And he goes that one. And all of a sudden General Welsh points down from the stage and he waves up my husband. He waves up Jeremy and he goes, yes. He goes, let's do a picture with all of us. I am the only spouse that has ever had that done in the history of the Joan Orr Award. The only <laughs> one, because guess what? what they did next year because I ruined it for everybody. They barely allowed that spouse to even speak to General Welsh or Secretary James. All right, Susan, thank you very much for being with us on Spouse World One to One. It has thank been, you, a, Dave. been a complete and total blast. Yes. You know what? We're going to have to get back together again sometime here in a close future so the, the Spouse World listeners can join in and keep up to date, up to speed with the, all the goodies that you're working on. Well, thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. I will gladly come back. Bye, Dave. Bye bye. Military Spouse World 1 to 1 is a BDE Productions podcast. The views and opinions of the host or any of the guests are not that of BDE Productions or sponsors. Be sure to like this episode and subscribe to Spouse World 1 to 1.